All right, well, I'm gonna introduce my graduate research assistant, Katie Grubb here tonight. She is the one that was out in the tunnels doing a lot of uh, doing the card collection and looking at the bugs that we were capturing on these sticky cards that Dr. Rudolph has mentioned a couple of times. And she's gonna try and summarize some of those results for you here today and just show you what was going on in these tunnels with the tomatoes versus the flowers and some of the different six and eight legged things that she captured and observed during the course of the summer. So Katie, go ahead and take it away. Okay, hi, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm going to share my screen. And while I'm pulling this up, I just wanted to say thank you for Dr. Rudolph to introducing me to this project and allowing me to be kind of the main entomologist on this project. Um, so yeah, I will be talking about the pests that I saw and all the different details about where they were and the effect that they had on the tomatoes, the flowers, and then the differences between the two. And then I'll also be talking about pests that were seen after tomatoes and then after flowers too. So during a normal production setting, there would be typical pests that you can expect to see. And in tomatoes, those are usually aphids, hornworms, and thrips. And if you aren't familiar with these pests, there's a hornworm down here. And then there are some aphids on these tomatoes. You can kind of see the aphid skins here. And then for cut flowers, you expect to see aphids, spider mites, and thrips. And this is a two-spotted spider mite right here. They're very small, so it's not always very obvious when they're there. How I monitored the pests was mostly using sticky cards. I also scouted, but I'll be talking more about that later. So with the sticky cards, we had blue and yellow. The yellow cards are usually for whiteflies, fungus, gnats, leafhoppers, just general pests, but I mainly found thrips and aphids on them. And we kept the cards up with clothespins and we had them about as close to the top of the plant as could be. As Dr. Rudolph mentioned earlier, we couldn't always get them exactly at that level. So sometimes they were inside the plant, sometimes it was around the plant, but we did our best to keep them right on top of the plant. For the blue sticky cards, they're usually advertised as thrips catchers, but we also got fungus gnats and white flies on these cards too. And I even did catch some aphids on the blue sticky cards. We had about 20 sticky cards per tunnel. So for the farms with two tunnels, that was 40 cards per farm. And then I collected them every other week for tomatoes and for flowers, I collected them every single week. And then as I collected them, I replaced them with a brand new sticky card to monitor for more pests. Once temperatures dropped, I scouted instead of using the cards because the row covers would get stuck to the cards and it was just a mess. So we decided that I could just scout and check for pests. And the way that entomologists do this is by using this hand lens, which is a very small lens and you can hold it up to leaves and you can see a close up of the insects on that leaf. So this is what you would see for aphids, for example. And then you can also use white paper and shake the plant. And then any pests on that plant will fall off onto the paper and you can kind of poke them or see if they're alive or dead. And you can also take that home and identify the pests under the microscope if you aren't totally sure what they are. I also did scouting when I checked the sticky cards, but I didn't have data for scouting because I didn't feel that it was important to collect those numbers because they were just, they weren't that important, but the numbers on the sticky cards are what really were important. So I will be sharing those soon. Here's just an overview of how the pest populations fluctuated throughout the seasons. As you can see, there's tomatoes and then flowers and different pests were there for different variations of time. So here are the main ones that I saw, and I'm gonna be going into detail about biology of these pests and then the different ways that they affected each tunnel. Except cutworms, the cutworms are not as important and I didn't have data on the cutworms because they don't stick to sticky cards. So just a summary, um, I told you guys earlier what the expected pests are, but actually what we found are the tomato pests were mainly white flies, aphids, and thrips. And then the main flower pests were a different species of aphid, fungus gnats, and white flies. Pest levels were the lowest in all the tunnels immediately after the tomatoes were taken out and right before the flowers were put back in or put in. 
So first, fungus gnats. Fungus gnats are minor pests, and they were pests pretty much the whole year. Um, they cause damage as larvae to the roots of the plants. Um, these larvae here will go down in the soil and they will eat the roots. So the plants that are affected by them, they might be weaker or smaller, and you'll often see adult fungus gnats, which look like this, but alive, obviously, flying around the leaves, and they're very slow flyers. They almost look like mosquitoes, but they're just a little bit darker. So here is the rates of fungus gnats that we saw in the tunnels. They peaked later, so they peaked during flowers, but I think the reason for this is because temperatures were lower, so it was more difficult to keep um, to keep the moisture content low because there wasn't as much heat to help the water evaporate out of the soil. So for controls for fungus gnats, you can use moisture control. You can watch irrigation. You can um, keep temperatures high enough that water will evaporate. And you can also use insecticidal soap. That's what I recommended. And you can also use natural in the soil to help with larva, with the larva. Now we're going to talk about thrips. Thrips are an early season pest and they really like heat. They survive well when it's really hot out. They're very, very small. Um, they're kind of hard to see sometimes. And they actually have two mouth parts that are asymmetrical and one will slice into the leaf and the other will go in and suck the sap. So they cut into leaves and they suck out nutrients. And when they do this, they leave this pattern of the streaking in the leaves. And this streaking pattern um, is seen on leaves when you have a lot of thrips. So in late June and July, in tomatoes, there were a ton of thrips. And some of the numbers that I got were in the thousands, like 5,000 for Fayette County and then for Breathitt County. Here you can see it's like 3,000, 4,000, just really high numbers. And for thrips, the low input tunnels actually had slightly more thrips than the high input tunnels. And I'm not completely sure why this is because as you'll see in some of the other pests, it actually flips, but that's just how it is. Um, the most important thing that we found, though, with the thrips is that they weren't really a flower pest at all. And usually thrips are one of the main flower pests. So this was just really important because when you have the tomatoes and then you plant the flowers later in the season, it's not hot enough for thrips to thrive. So this eliminates one of the major flower pests. But for control options, when you do have them on your tomatoes, especially in these super high numbers, um, you're going to want to recommend neem oil or insecticidal soap. And then during peaks, you'll want to spray spinosads. Now we're going to talk about leaf hoppers. And the leaf hoppers were also pretty interesting because they don't really overwinter in Kentucky. Leaf hoppers don't like the cold and they die out when it gets colder. So usually they'll be down south during the winter. Um, they're jumping and when disturbed, they'll fly off of plants and jump around. I know everyone's seen leaf hoppers, especially this past year, um, just walking around on the grass, they just fly up everywhere. So it's pretty obvious to know when you have leaf hoppers, but they do also leave that piercing sucking damage on leaves. Um, they have piercing and sucking mouth parts, but it's just like little straws basically. They can come in different colors, but the ones that I mainly saw were green. Here's the data on the leaf hoppers that I found. There were a lot of them, <laughs> especially in certain tunnels. The low input tunnel in Breathitt County definitely had the most leaf hoppers out of all the tunnels. And then it was interesting because the leaf hoppers peaked here in Fayette County and Breathitt County earlier in July. But then for Boyle County, they were more of a year-round pest and they didn't really start dying off until November. That was very interesting to me. And later I'm gonna talk about tunnel baking, what that is and what that might have done. And I think leafhoppers are one of the pests that might've been affected by that. 
because the data shows that in the two counties that did bake their tunnels, Fayette County and Breathitt County, leafhoppers aren't really a pest for flowers. They're only a pest for tomatoes. But then in Boyle County, they're still a pest for flowers. So that's just pretty interesting to me. Not sure really what that means. Um, but for control options, you can use neem products. Those are the best products to use for leaf hoppers. And you can also use insecticidal soap because that's just a good general product to use for pests. Okay, now the big one, aphids. Aphids are the major sap sucking pests that you will have. And you will have these on, I wanna say almost any crop, they just, they're really terrible. They're really invasive. Um, they leave a honeydew residue because they drink sugar water. They basically just suck all the sugar water out of your plants. They reproduce very quickly. Um, as you can see, it's one aphid produces tons more aphids. Most aphids are female. So there's going to be a lot of aphids and it can get out of control really quickly. The residue that they leave is called honeydew and it can cause sooty mold, which is like a black mold on plants and it causes wilting and then it also causes other things. And then the sucking damage can cause leaves to curl like this and then also worse. Aphids really like stressed plants and stressed environments. So as you're moving these new plants and smaller plants into the tunnels, they're gonna go crazy on those. So you really want to make sure that the plants that you're moving into the tunnels are free of any pests before you move them into the tunnels. And then you also wanna monitor those plants right after planting them, just to make sure that aphid populations don't get out of control. And then another thing about aphids is you might notice that you have aphids only because you see aphid skins. Um, so aphid skins might be left behind on the leaves or the stems. And that is one of the ways that you can know that you have aphids if you don't see the actual aphids themselves. And then another way that you might know that you have aphids is because there are ants. The honeydew that they leave behind is really sweet. So sometimes it will attract a ton of ants and just seeing a bunch of ants climbing on your plant doesn't always mean you have aphids, but a lot of the time it could mean that you have aphids. So here's the aphid data. There were two species of aphids that I saw, potato aphids, and I also did see some um, green, peen, or, sorry, <laughs> green peach aphids um, that affected tomatoes. And so these are the ones that I saw mainly. And then oleander aphids are these yellow aphids, and those were the ones that affected flowers. So the tomato aphids and the flower aphids were not the same aphids, but there were aphids still on both crops. So they did peak twice in almost all the tunnels. They peaked here, this is about June, and then they peaked here, which was at the end of September and October. Aphids can be controlled with neem oil and insecticidal soap. And then if they start to get really bad, you can also use a spinosad or like a different product that is for um, general, general pest control. So this was very interesting because aphids just affected both crops at a pretty high level um, in the hundreds. And whenever you see hundreds and hundreds of aphids on cards, then you know you need to treat because you really don't want them getting out of control. Now we're gonna talk about white flies, which are one of my favorite pests. Um, they will cause damage as larvae as well as when they're adults. And I saw different species of white flies too feeding on the plants, but there were different species on both tomatoes and flowers. So I don't think I, well, various species on the tomatoes and flowers. So I don't think that it was species specific like the aphids were. It was just kind of multiple aphid, or sorry, multiple white flies on all the different plants. White flies are these little larvae that will find a spot on the leaf and stay there and they will suck the sap from that one spot on the leaf until they get older and then turn into adults. And then once they hatch and turn into adults, they will climb around the leaf and then mate, lay eggs, and start the cycle all over again. So they can also leave honeydew, and 
They can also cause sap sucking damage, so like leaf curling again. Sometimes they'll leave these little skins, these pupa skins, but it's really hard to see because whiteflies are very, very small. Sometimes they're the same size as thrips or maybe even smaller. Here is the whitefly data. The peak times for whiteflies were June and July, so the summer, and they affected tomatoes. Um, the peaks for whiteflies were around 3,000, and then in Breathitt County and Boyle County, they never even got up to 400 or 500, so they were mainly just a problem in Fayette County during the tomatoes. For the flowers, they weren't really much of a pest. And then once again with the baking, these two counties baked their tunnels and this one didn't. So I'm wondering if maybe that had an effect on the whitefly populations, because here they aren't a pest at all, but then here there's a little spike right after the flowers go in. So that's very interesting to me, and I'm hoping to look more on that next year, or I guess this year. For control for whiteflies, you can use neem oil, of course, insecticidal soap, and that's what I recommended. And then malathion um, works really well for whiteflies, and I recommended that during peaks. Other insects that we found, and these all are insects that can't be found on sticky cards. And if they are on sticky cards, it's very rare. It's like maybe a couple, um, it, opposed to like hundreds or thousands. So cutworm damage was found on sunflowers. And this there, were a, there was a lot of cutworm damage on sunflowers. The cutworms will come out of the ground and chop flowers right in half. You'll end up with a ton of just empty stems and then dead flowers laying there. It almost looks like a lumberjack came and just chopped them off. So that was really bad. I think that definitely has something to do with the fact that, well, I don't know why there were cutworms, but it definitely impacted the harvest levels of sunflowers. Another pest that we found was stilt bugs and stilt bugs are found on tomatoes. We didn't find them on flowers. And those were found in every county as well. Stilt bugs are kind of a newer high tunnel pest. So there are lots of stilt bugs up in the Northeast in high tunnels. Um, sometimes they're used as natural enemies actually for biocontrol. So it's very interesting to see them now as pests because they do have those sucking piercing mouth parts that aphids have in whiteflies and other pests, but they do also eat pests like aphids. So that's just interesting that they were there um, and that they were causing damage to the tomatoes. I am hoping that more research comes out on stilt bugs so I know how to treat them because right now we're not really sure, but cutworms, you can use BT. Armyworms also can't be seen on sticky cards. Like I said, um, they were found on tomatoes and flowers and they cause really bad damage for both of those. They will eat the leaves, they'll eat the blooms, they'll even eat the tomatoes. They will pretty much eat anything. And the main ones we found were yellow striped armyworms. And for those, I did recommend BT too. And I think the BT helped, but it didn't completely get rid of all of them. So now I'm kind of gonna talk about baking tunnels and what that means. So baking tunnels happened after the tomatoes were taken out and before the flowers were put in. And it's where the tunnel is emptied of all the plants, closed up and then allowed to just bake for a while. The sun will heat the tunnels and they'll just get really hot and it can be kind of a sterilization method. It keeps diseases out, it can kill pests. And it was done in two counties, Fayette County and Breathitt County but not Boyle County. So that's why it's interesting to me in some of the data how pests stop becoming a problem when we put the flowers in, in the two tunnels, or sorry, the two counties where the tunnels were baked, but not the one county where the tunnel was not baked. So that's very interesting to me. And it might mean that baking tunnels will reduce pests completely, but I, we can't be sure because these are just preliminary findings. Possible other controls that you can use when you have a lot of insects. 
Weed control is one, it's very important because insects will hitch a ride on weeds and then weeds outside can easily become weeds inside the tunnel and these pests will stay on the weeds and live on the weeds. And then once you put new plants in, tomato transplants or when you put the flowers in, the pests will go from the weeds to the plants and it just provides a nice little safe haven for them. So you don't want them to have that. Another thing you can do is adding biocontrol agents. And we can talk about this later after my presentation too, um, or you can email me about it if you have more questions. But usually people will use ladybugs to get aphids or they have little parasitic wasps that you can use, or you can also use, I think nematodes or different bacteria to get thrips and spider mites. And then lastly, like I mentioned with the aphids, you really wanna check your transplants and seeds, make sure that you don't have any insects or any eggs, anything like that on them, because when you move the plants in, you don't wanna also move pests in. So for the upcoming seasons, I would like to put more emphasis on tunnel baking and just kind of be more aware of how long it's happening for, where it's happening, and then if that actually does cause a difference in pest volumes. Another thing I'm wondering about are the levels of thrips, because as you saw on the thrips slide, there were thousands of thrips on the tomatoes, but thrips overwinter in debris. And since the tomatoes were taken out and then there weren't many thrips on the flowers, and then the flowers will probably be taken out before the tomatoes go in, there might not be as many thrips this year. So that's something that I'm definitely going to look out for. And then for sunflowers, I'm hoping that we can get the cutworms before we put the sunflowers in. So I'm really advocating for early cutworm prevention, maybe applications of BT a few weeks before we put them in, um, maybe stirring up the soil a little bit. I'm not completely sure what the best way to prevent cutworms is but I will do some more research and then hopefully we can implement that in this next season. So that's pretty much all I have. Thank you so much for your time.